in the Montana wilderness. Happy New Year! Five friends reunite for an epic adventure. But this trip of a lifetime Avalanche! turns into their worst nightmare. It felt like being hit by a car. It was black and violent. I thought, I'm not going to survive. In the carnage, Let's move! one lies critically injured, <laughs> while another is buried deep in the snow. I remember this thinking, our friend's going to die. Matt, get us a sled. He's dead. Cut off from rescue by a powerful storm, they must battle to keep their friend alive. We were on our hands and knees, clawing through the snow. You have to get there tonight. We've got to take your boot up. The pain came crashing in. I was left wondering if I was the next person to die. On their way to ski the remote back country of Montana are friends Matt Schuyler and Sam Kavanagh. Skiing is 25-year-old Sam's greatest obsession. It's a pretty young age that I fell in love with skiing. I did it every opportunity I had, sometimes four or five days a week. When you stand on top of a mountain, it's literally like you can hear the clouds moving by. And you're the only person there. Matt shared that love and passion. <laughs> That's insane. The forecast was for snow, so not only are we going into a place we love to be, but we're going to have A-plus conditions. It was going to be just perfect. This trip is a rare chance for Sam and Matt to hang out with their three greatest friends. <laughs> Waiting for them at the trailhead is Sam's closest buddy, Blake Morstad. Haven't you finished yet? Blake is a special guy. He is amazingly intelligent, and he is a physical powerhouse. He would give you the shirt off his back. To Matt, Blake is more than a friend. He's also his brother-in-law. The final two members of the group are professional mountain guide Jason Thompson and emergency medical technician Chris Mackey. We're all very excited about the scheme but I think the overwhelming thing was just uh, being excited to just be hanging out with, with the guys again. It's New Year's Eve, and to celebrate, the friends are heading out to ski virgin powder in one of Montana's most isolated areas. It was extremely remote. We couldn't get emails. We couldn't get cell phone contact. But the whole idea of the trip was to go out and get some great powder skiing and have a blast doing it. Their destination? The untouched slopes of the legendary Mount Nemesis. The mountain is famous for powder skiing and notorious for deadly avalanches. But the men have come prepared. High avalanche danger to us is not a stop. It just means you need to be on your A game. Each and every one of us carried a personal beacon and all the tools necessary to extract somebody from an avalanche. We were not a group of punk kids that watched some ski video and said, we're going to go do that. We regularly ski similar conditions, and we were making good, solid judgments. Come on, guys, we're losing light. At the base of the mountain, the group ditch their snowmobiles and prepare to ski to their retreat. 
But to Blake, this is just another great adventure. Blake was kind of like a young kid in a candy store. First beer's on me. And it was like, this is already off to a perfect start. The friends have skied eight kilometers cross country to their base camp. They're now all set to see in the new year. Happy New Year! But Blake is celebrating something much more life changing. Okay, guys, I have a special announcement. Addie's pregnant. I'm gonna be a dad. Oh, oh, wow. 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 It was a pretty momentous moment. Good work, man. Blake, I didn't know you had it in you. Blake suddenly was gonna have a little man looking up to him and exploring life for the first time. And so we took out the personal video camera. And I remember Blake toasting his wife. Hey, Addie, I love you. I look forward to seeing Junior pretty soon here, too. <laughs> Happy New Year, Addie! Congratulations. We all fully expected that next year we'd be celebrating the craziness that was 2005. New Year's Day, there was well over two to three feet of new snow. See you later, guys. It was just perfect. <laughs> the skiing was phenomenal, so we were stoked. That first morning, we strictly skied in the trees because the conditions for an avalanche were perfect. A heavy snowfall has piled a huge load of powder snow high on the mountain slopes. Skiing too close to this fresh snowpack could trigger a lethal avalanche. That morning, we were extremely sensitive to our surroundings. But towards the tail end of the day, we started to push the envelope. Up there? Yeah. <laughs> We started moving slightly higher, but in doing that, we were unconsciously taking more risk. In their search for the perfect run, the young friends inch ever higher up the slopes, closer to the heavily loaded snowpack. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> See you down there. Finally, only Matt and his brother-in-law, Blake, are left up top. You all right? Go ahead. He skied off. And that was the last time that I saw him. 300 meters down the mountain, Sam and Chris have finished the run. There was just genuine excitement. Chris pulls out the camera and he looks at me, he's like, so Sam. What you think? That was awesome. But I gotta tell you, I'm exhausted. As Chris powered down the camera, suddenly you could just hear this distant, faint noise. And I heard Jason yelling out, Avalanche! When you hear the word avalanche, there is just a sudden cold shiver that runs up your spine. A terrifying wall of snow weighing thousands of tons is heading their way. Upslope, Jason is its first victim. Right. right next to me was a tree. I grabbed it. I start to feel the snow vibrate. What I experienced, I can only imagine, is like being hit by a car. My world, the world that I knew it to be, had completely evaporated. And 
I was now being subject to something that was not going to spit me out until it was done with me. It's a big impact when a wall of snow hits you at 100 miles an hour. It's like being tossed around like a rag doll. All of a sudden, I was being tossed and turned, not knowing which way was up or down. It was black, it was violent, and I thought, I'm not going to survive. To his horror, Chris Mackey realizes that the avalanche is sweeping him towards a dangerous precipice. I knew that there was a fairly large cliff below me. There was also nothing I could do about it. The nature of the terrain means that the sound of the avalanche hasn't reached 24-year-old Matt Schuyler up above. He's unaware of the disaster unfolding beneath him. From my vantage point, I couldn't see anything, and I didn't hear anything. He's waiting for Blake to shout that the way is clear for his run. I was waiting for someone to yell, go ahead. And I waited and waited and waited, and I finally started yelling down, Hello! 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 I just kind of thought, I'll just go down there and see what's going on. And I just thought, The avalanche has decimated the mountainside. Matt knows that down below, his friends could be dead or dying. Hello! 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 I thought everybody could be buried at this point. As far as I knew, I was the only one left. Jason! Grayson Blake! Hello! When I saw Jason, there was relief that there was somebody else with me. Jason, are you okay? Yeah, are you okay? Professional mountain guide Jason Thompson has freed himself from the avalanche. But he knows that buried under the suffocating snow, his friends have only minutes to live. Let's move! Jason told me to flip my beacon on and start figuring out where everyone was at. Each one of the five is carrying a beacon that emits a signal to indicate their location, even if they are deep beneath the snow. We got three people we have to dig up and get breathing again. We got 10 minutes, Max. We have very limited time. You take this side, I'll take over here. Blake! Chris! Blake! Chris! Blake! Down the mountain, Sam Kavanagh slowly regains consciousness. Moments ago, I was in the clutches of the avalanche. And there I am. I had floated to the top, and I'm only partially buried. The first person I could see was Chris. Are you OK? He's shooken, scared, but alive. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Somehow, despite being thrown over the cliff edge, Chris Mackey has also survived. There's so much snow, and it's so powerful, I didn't even feel it. There was probably two seconds of weightlessness, and then just a soft landing. There's a lot of adrenaline realizing, wow, I'm, I'm OK and then freed myself, turned on my transceiver to look for anyone else that could have been buried. I could hear Jason and Matt upslope yelling out our names. I'm elated, you know? Here. 
You hear? Hear? <sighs> Chris and Jason are okay. And I knew that Matt was okay because he's yelling out our names. Miraculously, four of the friends are alive and accounted for. Blake! But Sam's best friend, Blake, is missing. Blake? Suddenly, it's not over. It's not okay. Blake? Blake! 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 We have to find someone who's unconscious, buried, and we don't know where he is. Blake! It started to kick in. Blake! He's my brother-in-law, and he's buried somewhere. Blake has now been buried for several long minutes. Not only is his body being crushed by the compacted snow, he's rapidly running out of oxygen. I was thinking that we're gonna kill this guy if we don't find him, you know, because this is taking us too long. Blake! 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 the exact same moment Jason and I both picked up the faintest signal on our beepers. We didn't even say anything, just pointed. The signal started getting stronger and stronger. It's going 40, 30, 20, and I start saying out loud, 15. 10. Nine. Eight. All of a sudden, I could see the top of the backpack. Over there! Now that Blake has been located, it's critical they get to him and clear an airway, fast. Start from below. Before he dies from lack of oxygen. We're trying to get to his head to get him breathing. Using their avalanche shovels, they start to dig. But the snow has become heavily compacted in the slide. It was very frustrating. It was like digging up concrete threw my shovel aside and was just digging with my hands. I remember just thinking, we're losing him. He's right here, but we can't get him out. Come on, Blake! Come on, Blake! Come on, Blake! It was very frustrating how difficult the digging was. Come on! I just felt helpless. 30 meters away. Sam Kavanagh struggles to free himself from the imprisoning snow Blake! and help save his best friend. I started trying to move around, and I felt this pretty intense pain. Oh! And that's when I finally looked down. My foot was facing 180 degrees behind me. and there was about four inches of my tibia bone sticking through my ski pants. Despite his horrific injury, Sam is desperate to help Blake. But first, he will have to do the unthinkable. And so I really just tried to prepare myself. I grabbed it. I spun it 180 degrees. <laughs> I tried to stand and walk and shuffle my way down the slope to find Blake. Hearing the screams, EMT Chris realizes Sam is also in trouble. I looked up and saw that he was in a very tenuous situation. Sam, how you doing there, buddy? You okay? My leg's busted. It's really bad. Come on! Ah. Ah. This is just shocking. There was a very big laceration on the side of his leg and, and quite a bit of bone sticking out. It's gonna be okay, sir. It's gonna be okay. It's certainly the worst compound fracture I'd seen to that point. Okay. Chris is suddenly pushed to the limits of his training. Oh. He knows that an injury this severe, so far from civilization, could prove fatal. We just need to get Sam stabilized, try to control the bleeding, and get him off of the slope. But we were still right in the middle of, of dealing with Blake. We got him out! Finally, after being buried for almost 10 minutes, 
Blake Morstad is pulled from his icy tomb. At first, I thought, he's just passed out. We'll, we'll revive him. A couple pumps, and he'll cough up some snow, and we'll get out of here. Blake has no life signs. Compressing his chest will simulate his heartbeat, pumping blood round his body and keeping his brain alive. Back. Come on, pump his chest. One, two, three, four. Jason had me pushing on his chest and he's saying, Harder, go harder. Break a rib if you have to. I remember being really frustrated, thinking we're, we're losing him. They did CPR for a few minutes and they yelled up, it's not going well. Chris, we need you down here. Keep the pressure on here, buddy, okay? Stay calm. I'll be back, all right? OK. I raced down through the debris. Have you seen any signs of life? Okay, let me take Blake was white, maybe a little, little blue, and not responsive at all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. You're relying on your training, One, but it's a struggle. This is not a rubber mannequin. This is your friend, and he's not doing well. In the back of my head, I knew he was dead. But you continue just out of hope. Because this is, this is Blake, you know? I remember just looking at Jason and he was just like, this is, this is done, he's dead. And I just thought, wow. Thirty meters away, the terrible truth about his best friend is slowly dawning on Sam. I just waited for this physically dominating man to stand up and take care of me. I saw three people stand up, and one was in Blake. That's when my world came crashing, and I was left wondering if I was the next person to die. Expectant father, Blake Morstad, lies dead in the snow. That's a tough realization, that he was gone. There was nothing more that we could do for him, and that was fairly apparent. As a group, we just knew that our focus needed to shift to Sam. Guys, I'm getting really cold up here. The fifth friend, 25-year-old Sam Kavanagh, has suffered a horrific leg injury and is losing blood. Young EMT Chris Mackey knows he must work fast or watch a second friend die. I was very concerned for Sam. He was in and out of shock, which was kind of hard to assess. He had lost an incredible amount of blood. He's in shock. His body temperature is plummeting, and he risks hypothermia. I was becoming extremely cold. I couldn't formulate thoughts very well. And there was literally a voice in my head that said, if you want to escape the vicious, vicious pain, my body said, all you got to do is close your eyes. After losing his brother-in-law, Matt Schuyler is determined not to let Sam die too. I remember him shaking me out of this trance. 
And he's like, Sam? You're going back to Sarah. You're going home to your wife. For him to put me in that position of fighting for something that was so important to me, at that moment, I had a reason to survive. It's essential to get Sam warmth and shelter fast. But base camp is a kilometer away across rough terrain. Matt, uh, get us a sled, okay? Matt ran back and grabbed a toboggan to get Sam back to the hut. Before I could move him, I had to splint his leg. Splinting Sam's leg will close his wound and should slow the blood loss. But it also means grinding his broken bones back together. This is gonna hurt, right? Sam's a tough kid, but doing that with no pain control. One, three, one, two. That's about as painful as it gets. Three. By nightfall, the men begin their short trip back to camp, but soon realize that Sam faces a grueling journey. The deep snow and level terrain mean that the sled keeps sinking. We were on our hands and knees, just clawing through the snow. We were working as hard as I've ever worked doing anything. We were just going 10 steps at a time. And we'd just fall over, do it again. It just took forever to cover any ground. As the group struggles on, the temperature plummets to well below freezing, and Sam begins to show signs of hypothermia. Despite it being zero degrees out, I was sweating bullets. I was shaking uncontrollably. Multiple times, Matt and Jason bundled up around me, just trying to stabilize me. Sam, Sam, Sam. There was times where he just wouldn't really respond and we would shake him awake. Sam, you stay with us, buddy, okay? Hey, don't go to sleep, buddy. It was a critical situation, for sure. Finally, after two and a half hours out in the bitter cold, the group gets Sam into the shelter of base camp. Once we got back, there was a sense of relief. Easy, easy. On three, one. Two, three. Easy. Okay, okay, easy, 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 easy. Yeah, Yo, Sam. Okay. Yo, Matt, give me that water. Right. But EMT Chris Mackey knows that the journey may have done untold damage to Sam's shattered leg. Right. It's at that point where we needed to look again at his leg and I knew the boot needed to come off. Okay, Sam, that's gonna hurt. I tried to prepare Sam for the pain that he was gonna be going through. I want you to bite down on this for me, and we're gonna get this done, okay? Yeah? He bent down on a rag, and we slowly, precariously started to remove his boot. <laughs> Okay, go, come on, come on, come on. You have to imagine my leg is only currently being held on by the very back muscle. <laughs> and I remember yelling out, Just rip it off now! <laughs> it was pain that it takes your breath away. It leaves you gasping for air. Okay. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. Nor do I ever want to experience that again. Now that the boot is off, Chris can finally see the severity of Sam's injury and its deadly implications. This is just shocking. Sam was bleeding internally to the point of it being fatal, if not controlled. And there was really nothing we could do to stop the bleeding. <sighs> Sam needs immediate surgery. But high on the mountain, there's no mobile phone signal to call for rescue and it's far too dangerous to ski out in the dark. All the friends can do is watch over Sam and pray he lasts the night.
the decision that we made as a group was to wait till first light. And we took rotations staying up with Sam. And as the hours drag by, the friends' thoughts turn to Blake, who only hours ago was still among them. We were all mourning Blake. It was unsettling knowing that your friend was lying out there in the dark, you know, in the snow, alone. Sam Kavanagh has survived the night, but is fading fast. By now, he's lost over a third of his blood and is in dire need of a transfusion. His friends must summon help immediately. Camp started getting a little busy. Matt and Chris are up, getting ready for the trip out. And that's when we started going through packs. And realizing we didn't have all the stuff that we needed. Spare ski poles. They're in Blake's pack. Without ski poles, it will be impossible for them to reach civilization. But going back to revisit their dead friend is a task no one wants to complete. I'll go. You wait here. I followed our tracks up from the night before. I was a bit hesitant because it was like a bad dream at that point. And seeing the evidence of the avalanche made it all very real again. Found Blake. Searched around and grabbed some ski poles. It was a very odd thing to say, I realize. It was one of the most beautiful things I'd seen in my life. The violence of the day before had been replaced. It was uh, very quiet. You know, it was just me. Um, you know, just me and Blake at that point. So it was a very special moment. For four hours, they ski through dangerous avalanche terrain. Finally, they make it to the base of the mountain where they left their snowmobiles. From here, they're just an hour's drive from mobile phone contact with the outside world. And the one thing you need to happen is that snow machine starting. We couldn't get the stupid thing to start. It's dead. It was just, it was a nightmare. The snowmobiles belong to Sam, and Matt and Chris aren't sure how to get them started. We tried different ways of starting it. We kicked it, we cursed at it, we conjoled it. Without a snowmobile, they face a cross-country ski that could take as long as a day. High on the mountain, 
The situation is rapidly worsening. A storm front is closing in, and if it hits, any helicopter rescue will become impossible. The weather was changing that started to raise a red flag. I was really worried and concerned um, for, for my life. I didn't like the occasional whiff or smell that I would get from the decaying flesh. I knew that the life was slipping from me. But you have to hope that it's not over. My time wasn't done. I wasn't finished. Down at the base of the mountain, Matt is still grappling with how to start Sam's snowmobile. Sam is in a life and death situation. Nobody even knows. We just couldn't delay anymore. Chris decides he has no choice but to ski on. As I'm out in the middle of this big field, I hear the snow machine, you know, belch to life. And that frustration and anxiety quickly melted away. Once they emerge from the shadow of the mountain, Chris fires up his mobile phone. The first time we got half a bar, we called search and rescue. Hello? Look, my, my friend needs urgent medical attention. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay, but hurry. I distinctly remember talking with the head of the search and rescue. Yeah. He was very professional. He asked the right questions, and I said, If ever you needed a helicopter, yeah, this is now. Suddenly, you heard this very faint thud, and it kind of drew a little closer, drew a little closer. And then Jason came in, he's like, man, there's a helicopter. They're coming. And you could hear this helicopter closer and closer as if it's just right over our head. I'm elated. They're coming to rescue us. This is it. Then the helicopter would faint, and it would go away. Please! Please! Come back! We didn't know what was going on. Could they not see us? Because we could clearly see them. And Jason said, they're coming straight back. I'm sure. And the helicopter flew over. You could hear the rotors. And then they got a little quieter, they got a little quieter, and they disappeared. And it just went dead silent. 30 kilometers away, Chris and Matt have made it back to the safety of their truck, where news of the aborted rescue attempt is filtering through. Search and rescue kept saying, we can't do this, it's not gonna happen. They were in the middle of a snowstorm. There was 60 inches of new snow. They just couldn't land, it just couldn't happen. I remember Chris just telling them, our friend is gonna die. You have to get there tonight. I thought it was very likely that we were gonna come out of this with two people dead. The rescue helicopter can't try again till daybreak, and the mood at camp is desperate. There was anger, but I just had to try to make it to tomorrow. 
but by now Sam's leg is starting to decompose. And with no antibiotics to stop the spread of poisonous toxins, his organs are starting to shut down. I needed to go to the bathroom. And I was trying to pee into a plastic juice jug. Jason. And so I talked Jason into letting me sit upright. And as soon as I swung my leg down, it was literally like somebody had opened a faucet. Oh, God. Oh. And the stench of decaying blood and bacteria infested flesh was just compounding the fact that this was unsurvivable. I was scared and I was fearful. I had reached my limit. In the backcountry wilderness of Montana, search and rescue air crews are grounded by a fierce snowstorm. 2,000 meters up, Chris Mackey and Matt Schuyler have battled their way back to camp, where 24 hours ago, they left critically injured Sam Kavanagh fighting for his life. When Matt and I arrived, there was a big relief that Sam was still, still with us. But he was in a very tenuous situation. How are you, buddy? He had lost an incredible amount of blood. I'm not going to venture how much longer he could have lasted, but we were pushing that limit, I think. I knew that we were racing against time to get him to hospital. It's a desperate dilemma. Any attempt to drag Sam down the mountain would trigger further blood loss and probably kill him. His only hope of survival is an airlift but rescue helicopters can't land in the deep snow around the camp. Matt, come with me. Okay. I remember Chris said, if you want a helicopter to come in here, start stepping on snow and make an helipad. I knew if the helicopter couldn't land, we were taking out a dead body. It's early afternoon and the storm rages on. But then a glimmer of hope. A medical team have fought their way through the blizzard. They'll try to stabilize Sam until the helicopter can land. To have that level of expertise there was a big relief. They had antibiotics and some pain medication. Medically, pretty much took over. I was happy to at least be seen by a doctor for the first time. But when he opened up the bandage, he was shocked by the smell, by the infection, by the decomposition of the tissue. By now, the decomposing tissue is so poisonous Sam's condition has reached critical. A decision is made. Despite the risk, the friends will have to drag Sam down the mountain. It's a desperate strategy. Okay, Sam, we're gonna drag you out, okay? The whole group collectively began wrapping me in the sleeping bag. At that point, my injury was so bad, the probability of me dying halfway out was pretty high. One, two, three. I think there was a real concern that I may not be able to survive. I don't know, but, uh, and it was just like, this is a nightmare. Just couldn't lie there and watch him die. Okay, ready? Let's go. Wait, wait, wait. Suddenly, we got word that the helicopter pilots were going to give it one more try. Chopper's coming back. We 
we immediately started going to this makeshift landing zone that Chris and Matt had stomped out with their skis. Suddenly you hear the helicopter flying in and it's getting louder and it's getting louder and it's getting louder. And now you can feel the wind and the rotor wash and crystals of snow hitting your face. First time in 48 hours, I didn't feel pain. I was taken away from that, and uh, I was rescued. Chris Mackey went on to study medicine graduating from medical school in 2010. Today, he works as a hospital doctor in North Dakota. Matt Schuyler still lives and works in Montana, where he has three young children. Jason Thompson continues mountain guiding around the world. Sam Kavanagh was flown to hospital, where following an emergency operation on his shattered leg, doctors forecast a further three years of reconstructive surgery. Two weeks later, Sam opted to have the limb amputated. Today, he works in Montana as a civil engineer and cycles for the US Paralympic team. I've become an exceptional biker. I walk in the mountains. I run around with my daughter and my wife. The whole experience has taught me to live life and to love life. But it's emotional to think of losing Blake, <laughs> not just because he was a great guy, it was because he left a part of him in my heart. It's great to know that I've had people in my life have that impact on me, because I know ultimately that, that makes me a better person. <laughs> 